Why is it this map? I, <laughs> I actually didn't realize it's going to be not Altai. Guys, this is not Altai. Let's, let's not deny this is not what an Altai looks like. Uh, this is some weird amalgamation. Welcome, though, to a 3v3 battle. As I mentioned, we have got three players that are familiar faces from the solo series. Uh, we have definitely seen the likes of Iagas time and time again. One of the signature HRE boys back in the day. Converted Roost player, as you can see, he's playing it here. Then we've got TP Collector, someone who actually frequently appears on the channel at the moment. In fact, uh, you may know him by his, his real name, not his Smurf guys, because although he's in the red, he might as well be blue and Smurfed him. TP Collector is sort of one of the 16 players that made it to Red Bull Wallalo, which of course is you know, essentially the team champs, the world championship for Age of Empires. And then of course, rounding out, keep it up, you're doing great. Someone who sadly couldn't quite make it into the top 16, but really isn't that far away from that. I think he's actually a, a Leviathan leaderboard. Definitely some interesting builds, especially with certain sieves like the Ottomans that come to mind that we've featured frequently recently on this channel. This in the green is State. Meanwhile, on the other side, I'm not even going to try to pronounce these names. 3D something. I guess they're recruiting in different regions now. And then the purple player, I cannot pronounce either. Apologies. And then finally, Nico. Uh, Nico, I was able to confirm, I believe he was top 300. Yeah, 305th on team ranked, which is respectable, actually. That's pretty impressive. Uh, they are frequently like Conqueror 2, Conqueror 1, Conqueror 3, in that kind of area. So definitely no pushover of a player. And their teammates, I believe, were all in the top 1,000 when I checked, which was not easy, as you can imagine, given their names. But these guys grind a lot more of the team rank from what I've seen compared to the other side. You know, occasionally we'll see State sort of or guys forming up a party and going on a little bit of a grind for two or three games. It's not a frequent occurrence for them to the degree that actually they're still in their ranked experiences matching up against absurdly low-ranked players. For example, I had to siphon... This out of uh, a collection of games, one or two of which they were up against players who were ranked 30,000 on the team ranked leaderboards. So as you can imagine, they are not as experienced, at least recently with the new metas in team ranked. And we're going to have to see what they can do because they have gone for the ch form combined, yeah, combined arts rather of the Chinese, Rus, and the Mongols. And it can be an art because actually when I think of the way that these ships can play, there is a, a nice kind of like give and take, right? Like, for example, the Mongol player can kind of be self-sufficient with his own sheep setup, which can cover them hyper late game. But in the mid game, Roost players in team games used to always go for pro scouts. And this is definitely the type of game where you could opt for that. You've got two needy components to your lineup. If your Mongol player wants to go fast castle, he doesn't want to waste money on pastures. And on the other side of you, you've got the Chinese that are going to take those brilliant gathering rates on deers and inflate the worth of them by 20%. This should be your eco focus sieve, right? That Sword of's got here. The Chinese tend to boom population quicker than any other sieve in the game. Let's see if that is going to be the strategy here. Time being, of course, he just needs to snipe as many of the deer as he can. Almost guarantee that he's going to actually get 500 on the bounty. It's very difficult to not if you just think of the starting deer locations on a map like Altai and how guarded they frequently are. Interestingly enough, he did accidentally build the Kremlin for a sec there. We'll cancel it. I was about to say, I do not want to see a Kremlin in a 3v3. Kremlins and 1v1s are actually ridiculously strong because of the amount of time it takes you to get across. Wait, this is not pop. <laughs> Maybe that's what Guz was thinking as well. But just to kind of highlight this, when it does actually come live, uh, even with the changes that are coming to the Kremlin, even if this wasn't pop, I wouldn't expect a Kremlin. Simply because the map would be too large to cross in 90 seconds to get value out of Militia. And as we know, defensive landmarks equal offensive landmarks in Age of Empires 4. It's clearly been lost in translation. Sorry, just looking at actually what players want to do here. Because we haven't talked about the other side, right? You've got Malians, you have got the Mongols, and you have got the English, interestingly enough. So I would kind of expect on the south side, the English to play like pseudo aggressor, maybe kind of face off against any clash that comes early and then try to catch up themselves. Because as we know, English late game is very potent. Meanwhile, Marlin and, and the Mongol players should probably be looking to trade. That's kind of the desirable outcome here. You could even see a world in which actually it's just going to be the Mongol player trading. And instead, the Marlin is going to target a fast castle time to get the Furimba garrison units out. Furimba that can be pretty damn effective here, but... I have to remember, this is not the new patch. So, you know, these Musafadi Warriors sneaking in isn't as easily achieved as it will be once Season 4 drops. Because, of course, when Season 4 drops, anything that isn't a reconnaissance-type building or unit will not reveal stealth units. 
Interesting opening here with the pressure coming out. And as the 3D did commit into a few horsemen, he was trying to snipe out the scout vision. And speaking of those scouts, I wonder if we're still going to see the pro scouts come out. It hasn't been researched yet. It's definitely viable. Even if you only got two or three of the scouts, you'll return the value over time. But considering that he has now seen horsemen, this might actually deter Guz away from that build. Instead, he just might play a little bit more compact. And understandably, his teammates won't need the deer straight away, right? The beautiful thing about Altai is each player starts with a fairly safe deer stack. I say fairly safe because, you know, when you talk about the Mongol players, sometimes they move themselves away from the safety. But every other player in this, as you can see, has got easily achievable deer. Love this detail coming out from the purple player. Purple's actually going to be playing out onto the deer stack. Valuable play for the English. It allows you to go for a fast castle build at probably about eight and a half minutes if you're just prioritized on that. Pretty lethal timing. Considering that he did invest in a few of these Lombos though, his timing will probably be slightly skewed. Love where the Lombos are moving as well. So might have an opportunity to try and snipe out at least one of the scouts. Now there is a, a route around, so you should be able to dodge death for both. Or you know, you could just not notice at all. <laughs> So I think if you actually like micro this correctly, you could almost kill a longbow, but it's just not worth it to lose all your health. You'd rather just keep them alive, get the scout and vision in. And I believe he got pushed this way because the wall's going up with where he was located originally, so I think this one was more or less complete. And it is a full enclosure here, so you can see what the intent very clearly is for this team. Always the nuisance of having a Mongol teammate is you have to wall for him as well. I feel like my game is oddly quiet. Just give me a sec to check on that. Definitely feels quieter. I think we're good. Feels oddly quiet though. I need a drink. Oh, I mean, it's just going to be a game, a freebie for when one trades. I feel like the kind of drink I've got is not alcoholic enough for this. So let's talk about like where you want to strike, what time you want to strike, who's got the ceiling here, because both players actually have pretty lethal and similar late game characters, right? You've got the English on one side, you've got the Chinese on the other. So neither is necessarily afraid of going late. I think the Malian Roost is kind of the interesting diversification because of course we've got Mongol on each side. Uh, Malians to me, I feel like they can maybe peak a little bit sooner than the Roost, but we haven't really seen Musafadi Gunners utilize to their full degree. So I could be wrong about this and we could actually just see a world in which Roost suffer. I think where Roost could potentially have an edge is you know, the way that their, their Knights can actually remain quite lethal in the late game with the Sabres. Um, but still, even then we, when we look at that, you've got to consider Sofas. I feel like Sofas are still a heavily underexplored unit. These Lombos are proving a nuisance, but looks like the outpost should go up. Oh, beautiful micro. Stay, ooh, survive. Gus has been forced to build into the Horseman as well. So kind of annoying for him as a French, uh, as a Roost player rather to have to do this. But he's going to go for a second TC. So if they can kind of feign mid-map aggression and put their opponents on the defensive, they could get away with their own TC bit. In fact, I would not be surprised to see a certain player in the red going for three TCs potentially. The moment though, he has stopped at two. It looks like trade is already underway between their own trade points. Interesting, but makes a lot of sense, right? 3D just tried to block it out all over here. Well, Pink can't afford to be in two locations at once. Did stop the walls from going up, so keeps the map a little bit open. And hello, Caladian. Thank you for the subscription. Welcome, welcome once again to the Swarm. 12 months. 12 whole months and you still aren't tired of me. All this game. I'm impressed on both fronts. <laughs> kind of feels like... This is going really well for the Southern team though, right? Like all pressure is on North and North is just reluctant to come out and aggress. I think that needs to change if they want to improve their chances to come out ahead in this game. Like when you're on the defensive like this, you're just reacting to putting out fires, right? The fire starter is still about. And because the fire starter is a, a mesh of horsemen, you don't even have a way of preventing him from starting those fires. Metaphorical fires. Although if you get some torches out and burn through these uh, walls, maybe they could be a more literal sense. I think that's going to be their goal. I like the fact that Guz just started to ignore the raids and starts his own. Like, it's Mongol on Mongol, and you want to mirror what the other Mongol player is doing. The other Mongol player in this situation is simply raiding. He's not defending. So unless you want to put yourself behind, you, you have to actually kind of mirror this. I know, usually I say kind of get ahead instead of remaining behind, but this is one of the situations where just doing the exact same thing will get you ahead. 
However, the Magadai switch up. Man, I love this from 3D. Horseman into Magadai. Just a lot of dominance in the cavalry department, as you expect in a 3v3. Just kind of feels like Guz is always one step behind. And now this is one step he can't match, right? You expect him to be behind on Horseman because, well, the Mongols get access to their stables immediately at the beginning of the game compared to you in Feudal. But now that he's in Magadai, you've kind of been baited, right? Magadai can be chased down gradually, reluctantly by Horseman. But it's not exactly a quick death when you consider a Khan can just movement speed them away. However... One thing I will note is that that Khan is still in the offensive. So to that regard, these horsemen could have an opportunity to pinch. It's not going to be easy. Especially now the Spearman arriving. Nice assistance coming in from purple. He's going to commit the Lombos here. But if you can snipe out the Knight, it's actually worth it. Man, just look at the damage. It's kind of absurd to think about, right? Eight already because he got the level one upgrade on his range damage. You only have two armor. Your units get walled down quick. Like I said, you can gap close, but the amount of time it would take you to gap close, it feels like if you don't catch your opponent not looking, you're not going to do any damage to the Magadai at all. Trade is at least continuing, though. It's bustling by the looks of it, because it looks like they have started to actually push their opponent away entirely. Castle Age unlocked are coming in. Nico, Purple, and State now all up in Castle. This should be where we see more and more Lancers just kind of mixed in. Benefit of actually being the player just defending here as the Mongol is, of course, you have that yam, so you can even gap close on horsemen with these lances. That is, of course, something that's going to be a little bit of an issue, I think, for Pink until he sets up the network. I mean, he hasn't really got many outposts here, so if he gets forced to defend on the south side, there's actually no yam to work with here. And, well, you could say, well, that, that works both ways, KP, but the problem with that is you can see by the outpost layering, State's kind of covered the open area, right? It's not as easy to weave in when you consider the walling that's happening on the left side from red and blue. Oh, this trade is bumping big as well. Love the fact that you've got you've got sort of constantly on a kind of patrol here, right? It's his goal to just guard his economy and his, uh, his teammates, right? He doesn't need to be the aggressor here. He just needs to kind of turtle up for both of his comrades. And it's a cool way of kind of playing this comp, right? When you have Mongols plus Ruse, there's a lot of emphasis on cavalry, right? You've got knights or lancers, and then you've got Magadai or horse archers. You know, the Chinese don't really have something similar. Even some like Fire Lancers does a completely different role. It's not about raiding and killing. It's about burning. So maybe we see Fire Lancers further down the line, but for the moment, Chikinu just makes so much more sense. Speaking of Magadai. Proving a little bit of a nuisance here. Keep in mind, they still haven't been upgraded because keep in mind, the tech up is only now coming through for pink. So though you will away at the Lancers slowly, it's not going to be a quick affair by any stretch of the imagination when half your damage is basically being removed. Notice for now, it's just State's job to try and keep his opponent pushed away. Needs to be careful though. Musafati warriors are on the way. They did already waste their stealth though, so we'll be seeing them on approach. Musafati is so annoying in this kind of situation as well, right? Unless one of you wants to go Magadai or Horse Archers, you don't have a great answer to them. Even your Knights don't want to be clashing into this because in, in this kind of mass, with the bonus damage they get against Heavy, they can shred you like your paper. Another tech up coming out. It's just two players remaining to tech up, and both of them are on the pro team. Guns and Sword of. Sword of. It should be on his way soon. Guns now reaches up in the castle, and the breach comes through. An impactful breach, though. Remember, these Magadai, glass cannons. Definition of. They'll do a lot of damage, but they'll take a lot as well. Mr. Fadi, nice little clash there, but that's the lethality you got to watch out for, right? It's the stealth factor that allows him to get so close that by the time you realize what's happened, you've probably already lost a few of those knights. Walls continue to go up, and it's not going to be long before they fully protect their trade. Love the way they're kind of weaving into the stealth forest, trying to bait their opponent in. You know, Vision-wise, you can see the issue here when you approach it problematic, especially the Chugenu in there. Usually you'd just be able to turn around against the melee mosh pit, but love this play by sort of just keeping that pressure up, willing down his opponents, and notes they can keep baiting them in, dragging them back towards them where the Chugenu can kind of reign supreme. Do you need to be careful with the javelin throws, though? As the pressure is renewed. Nico now arriving with the second wave, and the second wave does pack a punch. The javelin throws now will relegate the, the relevance of what sort of is doing here. If anything, sort of needs to switch into some nested bees. He's still playing a very static comp, so he provides this kind of stronghold, kind of defensive element to the lineup. Don't expect him to raid, but expect him to 
be the pivotal deciding factor in these big engagements. Now it's going to be just spears being pushed out and more chicken new. Moment, I thought there'd been a, a little leak through, but just wildlife getting involved. Would love to see State just extend these outposts as much as possible. You notice he's been weaving them a little bit, right? So he has the yam. If he continues to move out and just structures them, it's very difficult for their opponents to take fights in those areas. Well, I wonder if anyone is kind of thinking about Imperial. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if the English player in this situation just tries to be a bit gluttonous. But I think there's a paranoia. When you know trade is happening on the other side as well, the longer you sit back, the more you give. That being said, when it's this big for one side, when there's this many traders already coming into the Mongol player, you have to feel confident. There is going to be a paranoia though. Unlike us, no one in this game knows how many players are trading necessarily. You expect the Mongol players, but as we can see, there's nothing to stop others joining in as Nico's about to do on one side, and I wouldn't even be surprised to see, say, a Roost player joining in on the other. And before anyone goes, what, Roost trade? Why? Why would you do that? It's the comp he wants to build, right? Like, you want to get into more of these knights, potentially alongside the horse archers. That being said, he could just forgo knights and go full horse archers as he is. I'm a little bit worried about who's bringing the melee then. You know, State probably wants Magadai just as much as you want horse archers. So it kind of feels like you're not really getting much deviation, shall we say, variation, if you go for this type of comp. Like, nobody is going to be able to tank. I think what the goal might be now for team north is for sort of to go imperial age if he can get his hands on the spirit way then he'll actually be a pseudo front line with these chuganu which makes a lot of sense because the chuganu are going to be unable to run away the reason they become kind of a pseudo front line by the way is because they heal 20 health over 10 seconds and they get an attack speed buff every time one of them dies and that juices everyone around them it's pretty absurd wave after wave continues the other side, in terms of boxes they need to tick, there's no real siege coming through just yet. And that feels like a missed trick. We'd love to actually see a world in which someone uh, in the pink, maybe, wink, wink, gets their hands on siege engineering improved and pushes just a small bulk of archers to build maganels. Or crossbows, whichever you choose. The alternative is that an English player could come up with two or three villagers, just build a small base here. Either one would tick the box, because right now they, they kind of lack this ability of punishing saturation. Right, when I see this many archers, I, I'm, it's just right for Maganels, you have to. Instead, that saturation is going to come from the other side, as we are finally going to see sort of getting into the nest of bees. Nest of bees that will shred these javelin throws, by the way. Premium unit, 120 resources, only 80 health. It won't last long against the fire. Notice how long this uh, torture is going to take. Nesta Bees can do a lot of damage here, sort of. Shots cancelled. So we'll not get the full whack he was looking for. But a threat now looms. They realize it. There's no easy way to approach this base without anti-siege. Nobody on their team is providing it either. Little raids on the flank. Not really finding too much value. Love the fact that 3 is trying to extend that outpost network. Very surprised that they didn't extend it in the center at all. That's the beast damage coming out as well. Just look how heavy of a hit it is. Need to be respectful of this. Maganel also added in. Love this from State. The damage straight away. How many javelins dead? That mango just paid for itself. Won't be able to get another shot out, but it's being baited. Nesta Beast follow up is good. <laughs> okay. That was actually well played by State. He knows he's going to lose the Maganel. He doesn't even try to pack it up to move away. Just tells sort of to go for a Salvo and instantly kind of pays for itself. Heavy damage on all these units. Keep in mind that no Civ on the south side has healing either. Right? This was not an Abbey of Kings build. No one else has built into picking up relics by the looks of it. Definitely hasn't been building into Shamans. So any damage done is kind of permanent. Now, we are reaching a point where, you know, you'll eventually get the pop cap, whoop de do, lose units, replace. But... It's not going to be much. Okay, in, in fairness, I may have been lying on the heal. There is the curl tie, let's not forget. It's not exactly a quick heal, though. It's not healing at all. Uh, what? Do you know how healing works? 
I mean, in fairness, this isn't realistic at all, right? It, this is actually more realistic. In what world could you put a plus over someone's head and they just get healed? All right? I don't live in that type of fantasy world. I live in one of reality. You take your injuries, you live with them. Oh, they're glowing now as well. Wait, look at that. Do they even get the damage? They get the damage increase. Okay, you see the plus force. That's working. But the healing doesn't work. It says it does. I mean, I'm surprised the English don't at least get it here. I mean, come on, NHS, right? But... <laughs> this is so dumb. I... Oh, my God. I don't even think this is being fixed with the new patch. Oops. I'm going to keep looking at it like I'm exposing a scam. <laughs> ah, that's what this is, guys. This is some of that, um, you know, that kind of... Her, like, not herbal he healing, right? The kind of uh, scan type healing. Oh, that no, that's too biased. That's too revealing. We need uh, the, the subtle name for it, right? Spiritual healing. It's spiritual healing. There you go. Can I just know how fabulous Jalen Ferro's hats look, by the way? <laughs> not fabulous enough to distract from the fact that it doesn't work. Uh, does it heal the Mongol player himself, at least? Uh, he would have to come here for us to know. It should, though. Considering all of his units are full health, yes. So I think he got whirled away a lot. <laughs> Can't believe that though. It's so stupid. So let, let's move on from this, focus on a few other things. Because Purple has still not got Network of Citadels, but continues to extend their reach. We'd love to see them switch that up, just get that missing component. Meanwhile, Pink on the backside has made their way in. However, Magadai and Magadai clash. It's got to favor State here. State has home field advantage. In fact, another issue that you have is, you know, <laughs> Not just the Hortz Archers. The other deal I was going to highlight there is if State had put the Lancers ahead of the Magadai, then your tanky unit would be taking all the damage. So you just win out in your glass cannons. But anyway, they will be able to finish off the last of the Magadai. A few more trades are going to be scalped. That's a heavy hit, actually, for State. He doesn't have as many traders. Nowhere near as many, in fact, as Pink. Now the aggression comes in on the front side. Love this detail, right? They bait away the cavalry, and now they go. Kurultai looking to unpack. Blocked by the Marlin player. Unfortunately, the situation, the Nesta Peace damage coming through. Panic starts to set in. Second salvo can come through on the English line. And looks like the Nesta Peace are humping for the moment instead of actually just firing off. Oh, it's open fire now. Chugi New able to hold. Just look how much work that fortified Palisade done. Prevents the push long enough. And now when you get through, we're talking about an Imperial Age Chinese. This is what I mean by pseudo front line. Chugi New laugh in the face of danger. Unless you have Maganels, you have no answer to this. It's called, it must be in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle Land because I feel like I'm looking at a shredder here. Damage coming through, even against the Javelin Throwers, is substantial. Mustafadi now trying to ambush. But wave after wave, ready to return fire. Triple Maganel now rolling out from Guz. Pushing back against this. The Cruel Tie needs to retreat. They're outnumbered heavily here in this situation. And... They're going to have to give over a lot of ground. I wouldn't be surprised if this is now going to be the push through. The push through that we've been waiting for, by the way, right? With two players now in Imperial Age versus one on the other side, this is probably go time. Especially after the damage you took on the trade line, you can't afford to just sit back anymore. That's that will continue the approach. That will reveal the castle, so they'll need to bring up some siege. Looks like a fort the Huntress is going to be built in the center. Marley's looking to tech up here. But not before every member of the Norman team tech up. State has joined Imperial Age now. These Magadai are going to be like Gatling guns. They just need to get in. Tech up's coming through every player. Only one remaining. This Marlian trying to play for a forward drop with the Imperial Landmark is a bit ambitious here. Could cost him dearly. Mangoes. So many of them. They can actually just take out the castle themselves. Uh, honestly, I... I think the Marlin player might choke on this. I mean, it's 10 villages to build up a castle. To build up castle is a landmark. The enemy are already approaching your line here. I, I would be very surprised if he gets this. Like, let me check the vision. They see. They know. Horse archers. Pushing in a little here. Not many villages that need to be sniped either. Remember these horse archers, they do 16 damage. So they can actually counter javelin throws quite nicely. Dive though. 
Guz starting to move forward. Has got the incendiary arrows to work with. Cavalry getting ready to wrap around. Now they have to stop this landmark. It's just a golden opportunity. We need some assistance. Looking to bait them in a little. In a choke point. The Mangos, they could do some significant damage here. There is a little bit of paranoia. Notice that Pink's going to back up. He is countered by Mangos. Shots coming out. Javelin throws harassed. Villagers count down to eight. The landmark, it can't go up. Shugay new now targeting. Brilliant move by Sword Off. He's going to prevent it. That heal factor just sustaining long enough to ensure that the Fort of the Huntress is not going to complete. And the Maganels are smashing through. What a play. What a counter. No landmark, no tech four for the Malian. He has to reset and go again. Behind this, behind the line. Now, this is going to buy time to react still. Plenty of mangoes to work with. They could even think about taking out the castle and making their way in. And even if you do get this Fort the Huntress up, think about the delay on this. Right, he has to pull more villagers to do it. He has to get the build up complete. Then he has to get his tech unlocks. This should be a lot of ground gained for the Northern team here. They should be able to take out this castle and begin to push their enemies back. Of course, still no access to the trade, but still significant ground gained. These raids beginning to become a little bit futile from Ping. He's trying to find his way into the trade on the backside, but looks like it's being covered by the cohort. I have to wonder what's the way now. Because it feels like you're playing from behind, right? You get burnt an army like that. You've got Magadai that work great when they've got some kind of flexibility on where they move. When you're the defensive player though, Magadai are horrible. Because what happens is whenever you're defending, usually you're gonna be around these buildings like this, right? And these buildings create funnel points. They create choke points. Two points that usually are great for range comps. Not when you're against Maganels and Nesta Bees, though. Not with glass cannons like this. Not just that. Look at this. Notice how quick the Bleep Palace Guard are. That, my friends, is a, a cheeky little dynasty. One that will give you a boost to your movement speed. Okay. Great to see this UI is still not working. There we go. Updates. Yuan Dynasty. 15% movement speed. The Palace Guard almost moves as quick as the Magadai. There's no getting away from this. Remember, these Magadai are not cheap either. See for yourselves, folks. You pay an arm and a leg to build these bad boys. 160 resources. It's crazy to actually think how efficient of a trade this is for Sword of. Especially with the Chuganu on the Lonesome. I mean, they've got good enough range to counter the Magadai. They've got better damage. They've got better sustain due to the healing factor. This is a very difficult game. I do love the fact that 3D started to build up these outposts with the cannons. But that in itself is not going to gain you much ground, right? Like, it's going to hold you for the moment, but it's very difficult to now move forward and build more of these. Well, we're talking about the front. It looks like someone's trying to sneak into the back. And they did a wall. Oh, no. No, that's the type of trust moment that makes me never trust anyone. The Marlin player sent one villager to do this. He has at least got the backward line covered, right? With the stone walls up. So that's not going to be exposure point. But you could even wrap in at this point. I think there's still a way. And State might sniff it out. He's moving on through. Even if he doesn't get any deeper than this, he's distracted. He's moved part of their force away. In fact, a substantial amount of their force away. Sort of. is taking that opportunity now to push in. Most of these cannon placements have just been whittled away at. Chicken, of course, a, a great pseudo siege unit with this much damage output. Remember, you've got all this resistance, but at the end of the day, each of these units is doing free damage against a structure that has 750 HP. And, uh, attack speed arrow as well. I mean, this is going to be a wipe of Pink's army. Now, Pink is probably the one of the three that can afford to replace the easiest, but he's also the one closest to where the exposure point's going to be. He's also playing with a teammate that is running a static comp, right? English players don't tend to move very fast. Not with mass men at arms. I, I actually think they've got a very big issue around mobility because of this. It's kind of crazy to think that the one member that was immobile on the northern side doesn't have this issue either, right? Think about the Chinese. Because they got the Yuan Dynasty, that extra movement speed, they're able to flex. We said already that the Palace Guard are essentially two-legged cavalry. 1.58 movement speed. For reference, a cavalry unit usually is 1.62. Meanwhile, these chonky men-at-arms, as tanky as they are, 
they can't really reach about 1.12 movement speed. Definitely the slug amongst the cheetahs. Oh, well, well, well. Stay. How the turns of table. He says it's time for a little bit of vengeance. I, I don't remember what you done to my trade. So uh, in the spirit of trading blows, let me return the favor. And folks, these are elite Magadai. They will meet quick work of the traders. And it's not just the Mongol players being punished now, it's also the Malian player. A lot of punishment come their way as well. And this wall in feels more like a grief. Don't forget to place a, a gate there, purple. Still, the amount of trades they're going to lose, I, I mean, you have to peel them off. I like the fact that he's finally doing this, but the delay has already cost the Malian player dearly. Well, no doubt cost him more. The worst part is now, when you end up pop caps, you've got pop cap that actually isn't doing anything because they're not trading anymore. They're forced to idle. Just as it always is with Mongols, late game Magadai truly is a crucifixion experience for the opponent. So many dead traders here. I mean, I wish I had a statistic to show you. And now, in the center, I mean, what's the response, right? You've got a slow-moving force. Musafadi gun is. We're finally going to get to see them. But, folks, I don't think these beat Chugenu. I think these lose to Chugenu. Chugenu that have more range and more damage output. Okay, more damage output may be a stretch. But not that far off, really. 11 times 3, so 33 compared to 38. Then look at the attack speed. 2.12 compared to 1.75. Then consider the fact that because he has the spirit way, his attack speed gets buffed. I, it's not even fair at that point. The 20% increase in attack speed brings the Chugenu down to what? I want to say roughly, let's say 1.5. I honestly don't know how you win with Musavadi Gunners. I, I think you lose. You can at least do a Magadai. That's one advantage you have, but... Right now, they don't have a great solution to Chugenu. Even the Javelin Throwers, if they don't keep their distance, they will get rinsed. It's like the last of the Magadai finally got cleaned up, but folks, look at the damage. Remember how fat this trade line was? Where are you now? Atlantis. Oh god, that song stuck in my head. Well, Atlantis seems appropriate because they're going to need something that probably doesn't exist to win this now. I think they might be done. Unless they can find a way of sallying out together, which right now they're not, right? They're kind of discombobulated one by one in these different engagements. Culverins is a cute play coming out from Nico, but Nico, he just doesn't have the defenses. And considering the hit to his backline gold, it's not going to be easy to replace such expensive units. Where is it that you kind of target if you're the southern team? I mean, you need to find some eco damage. You're not winning direct fights. You need to find a way of going around. But if we check the pop cap, I think you'll see the real issue here. 3D down to 150. Then you've got 175 for purple. And then Nico down to less than 100. There's your issue. His economy is only 56. I, I think the Marlin is too weak now. And they had this very strong time around Castle Age, but folks, we're far past that. Musavadi Gunners, we said we didn't get to see them often. I'm kind of seeing why. When you reach this late into the game, if you take any sort of eco here, you're not really structured to replace the losses. It's like the Chicken New will finally be cleaned up. Keep in mind, that was like the first battalion of many to come. And considering that all the, the boxes have been ticked, all the checkpoints have been passed, we might even just see a switch in the pass guard so you can keep raiding deep. Salt in the center, though. Fought the Huntress, trying to stabilize them. We'll force it back away. Show a cheeky little bit of respect here. So they'll fall back towards the choke points with the Maganel still cover them. No easy kind of squeak in there. You notice what was happening. State is trying to weave his way back in with the Magadai. They get told, no, you're going to have to stand and fight direct. Stand and fight, they will. Notice the state, he's just trying to kind of budget his troops to cover the Maganels. Maganels really are the MVPs here. Heavy amount of damage coming in. The men at arms, just look at their numbers. Look at their health bar. Watch what happens here. It ain't going to be pretty once the Maganels open fire. <laughs> oh, and the Musafadi. 
but this is always my issue. I'm just looking back, and if we check Nico's numbers, you see the problem here. He's a liability. He's gone for an expensive comp, but he doesn't have the economy to support it. I wouldn't even be surprised if they're tributing him resources to keep him in. Well, he's definitely not going to recover himself, because look at this. Palace guards are leaking through everywhere. I'll tell you what, I hope they don't go to collect water with this bucket they're hiding in, because it's got plenty of holes in it. And I can tell you. The Chinese especially are exploiting that to the fullest. It's kind of funny that State can't get through anymore because they're blocking him so hard. But because they're so focused on keeping the Mongol player out, nobody's really addressing the Chinese player. I, I don't know how you come back from this. I mean, they'll keep trying to hold on, but they should kind of feel the writing on the wall, right? Their economy has been heavily crippled and they're not actually doing anything to count the economy on the other side. They're just falling further and further behind. In fact, if we cycle through the, the resources, <laughs> sort of has plenty in the bank. Yeah, State is looking fine as well. And then Gaz, good lord, man. I mean, honestly, feed the world at this point. When I look at the other side, you know, Purple's barely got enough food together. Nico struggling on wood and gold frequently, despite the fact he's got 3k. And still, at the end of the day, they continue to give ground over. Definitely an interesting experimentation for Nico to go into the Moose Safari Gunners. I don't feel like they should be outright written off, but this is kind of a lesson in economy. You have to have an economy to support what you're doing, and he just didn't. Or rather, it's that he didn't have an economy that could support it if he ever took damage, right? That was the difference here. The way State built his base, the way State kind of structured the comp, he didn't overreach. So even after he lost all the traders, he had a way of recovering. And the cool thing is the dynamics of having Chinese and Bruce on your team and the way that they built with the multi-TC approach covered you to recover. The problem on this side is the moment the trade got shut down, it didn't just ruin the party for one player. It ruined the party for two. And I think that's the greed, that's the gluttony, that's the punishment for going multi-trade. If you're going to do multi-trade, you always have to be the aggressor. You haven't got any easy way of defending yourself. And as a result of that, when you compare the other side where you've got this double TC boom from two players, their economy is a lot more retracted, but also recoverable. Well, Mongol Raid will make its way in, but I think at this stage, folks, it might be a little bit too late to get substantial damage done. Given enough time, maybe. I just struggle with the idea of getting enough time on this. That being said, I could be wrong. Kind of feels like they're not reacting, right? And I think the reason they're not reacting is they realize they can trade more efficiently. And they already are. State once again in. We'll meet more Magadai. But remember, the second wave is on its way. Sort of, with plenty of troops to add into the mixer. I think too much central control is now being carved out by Northern team. South has to play the flanks now in a very predictable fashion, and they've already been walled off. So Magadai, while they did do a decent amount of damage, I still don't think it's enough. In fact, if I look at States, yeah, States got plenty of gold in reserve. This doesn't even end his economy. So he can reboom. Meanwhile, Pink. He's got plenty of Magadai, but he spent so long guarding. Guarding what? Like, there's, there's scraps left of your trade. You needed them in your base. He just lost all of his food source. In fact... This many Magadai, and you are down to just over six, uh, just under 60 villages, rather. Honestly, I think it just got cut and dry now. I, I expect wave after wave to just be targeted here. Remember the weakness of the Mongols. If they ever reach your primary base, they can shut down your food just like that. Because there's this giant meat kebab on the floor. Oy, oy, oy. It's like the Magadai will finally be cleaned up in their own base. And I still, I just look at the trade numbers and I feel like sort of, I'm not sort of, sorry, State is uh, far enough ahead in terms of resources saved. He'll recover. 27 trades. I think he actually has more traders than Pink. He does. And Pink's not even using them anymore. I mean, this game is done. An interesting idea to go on the flank raid, but no one ever covered him. I mean, this was a game of consolidated force. 
the pro team actually work together to reach their timings and then frustrate an attack down the center. And while the southern team did this initially, their late game was scrappy, discombobulated, and shredded. Right, I think actually looking at this, they didn't get an opportunity to fight together as free in the second half of this game. And that is why the trio of pros come out ahead. They understood that teamwork makes the dream work.